Yeah, because what is this um, markets, but yes, yeah, yes, yeah. but um, the, the 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 risk trade yes. uh, and why the risk trade you believe is going to break down here. A mm. um, couple of our audience uh, have have written in and said, um, is there a chance uh, Hugh Edward, for example, in London writes in, do you think that the earnings season will finally be the reality check that this market needs to get back to more realistic equity prices? Clearly, he feels that the market needs to go down. Uh, the recent speculative rally in commodities and equities seems to have been purely technical rather than based on any fundamentals. But you've got a good line that ties in the Chinese yuan and the activities of Chinese speculators with this appreciation in commodities and, and this risk trade. Let's talk about that and why you think it's the case. Yeah. Well, f first of all, um, I think um, one should be wary of emphatic declarations with regard to the future. And as periodically when I have a glimpse, when I have a naughty glimpse at the show and another guest that you have on, I'm always struck with how emphatic they are. The dollar will go down. Gold will go up, um, etc. Yeah. So um, this is the future. I haven't seen the future, and it's conjecture. But I have a chart. We've got it. We've got it on the screen, and it shows a remarkably tight correlation between the oil price and the value of the Chinese uh, currency, the renminbi. Now, for the last decade, the, you know, the story is China, yeah, and the Chinese currency is too cheap, and they have this wonderful competitive advantage for all these people and productive capacity, and a cheap currency. They've been under pressure, and the currency was appreciating. Now, in that environment, what happens is, I'm a Chinese speculator. I borrow money in dollars, because I know that as my currency appreciates, I'm going to have to pay less and less money back. Now, I've got to do something with the money, so I take risk, and I buy equities, I buy gold, I buy oil. Oil is more risky. Um, now, as we hit the third quarter of 2007, the US goes into recession. It's the first economy going into recession. And what they do is they bring interest rates down. Now, at that point, not, not only is my Chinese currency going up against the dollar, but suddenly the interest that I'm being asked to pay has collapsed to nothing. So I'm just having a big party. I want to borrow as much money as possible in dollars. So the renminbi kind of accelerates in its strength, and all of this liquidity gets thrown into the oil market. This is this time last year, Jeff, and oil goes to 150 bucks. It goes up $50 in seven weeks, and we're all sitting there going, wow. Right? Now, my only point to you is, the one non-confirmation in the world is that since July, the Chinese currency has done nothing, has gone flat vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. Right? And in doing so, that, that took the crutch away from oil prices and, and risk, and, and everything collapsed. Right? So it, there seems to be something in that relationship. If you see on that chart, as soon as the renminbi stops appreciating, the floor gets taken away. Now, this year, of course, there's been this enormous bounce, rally, bull market, call it whatever you want, but prices have gone up in risk assets. The one non-confirmation is the Chinese currency isn't going up. So my take on that is they're still struggling. Of course they're struggling. Yeah, um, America's down on its luck. The export market is weak. If you look at rail loadings, if you look at ship loadings, if you look at activity going through ports, business is profoundly weak. The strongest part of the economy is the stock market. Yeah? Um, and until that changes, the Chinese will not allow any appreciation in the currency. So we don't have to entertain that fantasy and pathetic debate where we pretend that their GDP is growing at 8%. It's not, right? But the it's currencies not. haven't really moved across. I mean, if you look at the dollar euro, for an example, it's completely flat. Also, since the beginning of this year, I mean, it's not just it's not just against the Chinese currency. Um, no, no, no. The um, if you look at the euro dollar, um, as we had the, um, the the collapse in risk, the dollar went up. Um, it went uh, the euro fell from 160 to 120. Yeah. It's no longer at 120, Louisa. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's now 140. So you're having, you know, you're having movement. The the dollar is five percent weaker versus the euro on the year. Um, the renminbi is the one that hasn't done a thing. Hasn't done a thing. And as I say, my in my crazy head in this day and age, when everyone is anticipating inflation, not just inflation, hyperinflation. I'm saying to you, what if we saw it? What if we saw it between 2002 and 2007, and it wasn't the quantitative easing of the Federal Reserve, it was the mercantilistic trading policies of the surplus countries, which kind of suppressed the value, kept their exchange rates cheap, and therefore created these foreign exchange reserves. 
these sovereign wealth funds are really just quantitative easing programs. And if we look at that five-year period, gold broke a 27-year trend and actually went up. It went from $250 to 1000 the dollar lost 40% of its value. Mm. 40. That is one of the biggest collapses in the dollar ever. 40%. Oil went from 10 bucks to 150. Which is maybe why yeah. we saw those reactions because of yeah. the dollar collapse. As I say, but maybe maybe we've had all the inflation, and and today prices are falling. Retail prices are falling, and yet everyone wants to talk about hyperinflation. So I'm just curious. At, you know, these, these shifting plates and how they don't seem to be aligned, expectations versus reality, are a little bit skewed. Let's, uh, let's um, get a, a view. Uh